Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Today, I'm honored to interview Dr. Peter Berkowitz, Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff. He and his staff recently uh, released a timely and detailed 70-plus page report titled The Elements of the China Challenge. Before we jump into today's discussion, a bit of housekeeping. FTD is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on foreign policy and national security. We take no foreign government or corporate funding. We are pleased to bring you today's event as part of our China program, where our experts provide timely research, analysis, and policy options for Congress, the administration, the media, and the wider national security community. For more information on our work and on our China program, please visit FDD.org. With that, I am pleased to introduce today's guest, Dr. Peter Berkowitz. Dr. Berkowitz joined the State Department from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. His scholarship is focused on, among other things, constitutional government, conservatism and progressivism in the United States, liberal education, national security and law, and Middle East politics. He has authored hundreds of articles and essays and four books on a wide range of subjects. He has taught on those subjects in both the United States and Israel. So Peter, I wanna thank you for taking the time to speak with us today on the challenge of China and how to leverage the full scope of American power to counter that challenge. Well, thank you, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. Well, great, let's, let's dive in. Let me start with kind of a, maybe, maybe an easy question. Hmm. Maybe just, if you could describe for our audience the role of policy planning at state. This is a very uh, specific arm of the State Department uh, with a somewhat powerful role historically. Uh, if you would take a few minutes to just explain uh, the organization that you run and, and what it does. Sure, happy to do so. So the policy planning staff is a relatively small office, all told 22, 23 members, uh, researchers, administrative assistants, 30 people. Uh, and we are part of the office of the Secretary of State. The Director of Policy Planning reports directly to the Secretary of State as a, as a senior advisor. What are our tasks? There are a number of principal tasks. Um, for one, we, we engage in the work of clearing papers within the State Department. Um, that's actually an important role. Um, we ensure that the writings that uh, go to the secretary uh, and go out the building uh, conform to, uh, um, conform to uh, uh, building protocols, uh, the building, the secretary of state's sensibility, that they're well argued and so on. We're not the only office that does that, but we're, um, we're uh, often on a crucial part of the clearance process. In addition, um, this policy planning staff writes notes to the secretary. Um, our notes are distinguished in that our notes are not cleared by anybody else. We write short notes, uh, uh, usually not more than two pages. They go directly to the secretary. And these notes are intended to involve a stepping back from the hustle bustle of daily diplomacy take a look at the big picture, uh, provide analysis of how well policy is doing, uh, what steps we might take to improve policy, to anticipate unintended consequences, and to put alternatives in front of uh, the secretary. You can imagine that that sometimes creates clashes within the bureaucracy, since in a sense, the job of the policy planning staff is to meddle in the affairs of every other office and every other bureau offering opinions to the secretary both about um, uh, how to approve and how to avoid uh, how to avoid mistakes in addition the policy planning staff um, is occasionally tasked with special projects one special project for example was the work of the commission on unalienable rights which the secretary created in july 2019 uh, he gave that commission for which I served as the executive secretary, it was chaired by Marianne Glendon. He gave the commission the special task of uh, regrounding America's undoubted commitment to human rights and foreign policy in America's founding principles and constitutional traditions and regrounding America's undoubted commitment to human rights in the obligations that we took on in 1948 when we 
led the fight for um, to pass the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the in the UN General Assembly. One special project. Another special project that uh, this, the policy planning policy plans that has taken on during my time here is the paper that has brought us together today. The elements of uh, of the China challenge. And again, what what distinguishes this paper, or one feature that distinguishes it, is we step back, we take a broader look. There have been many many papers have been pr produced by the Trump administration on what we call the China Challenge: National Security Strategy of 2017, National Defense Strategy of 2018, an important paper this spring by the uh, uh, by the White House National Security Council focusing specifically on China strategy. There are other documents. Our paper is designed to synthesize uh, what has been said and capture the orientation of, of the Trump administration, an orientation that we think is um, uh, represents a fundamental break with longstanding conventional wisdom about China. Thank you for that for that overview. It certainly sounds like uh, policy planning operates sort of like a, a think tank almost within the State Department, so that I can absolutely yes. identify with. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, that Commission on Unalienable Rights, uh, that was a speech that the secretary delivered in my hometown uh, of Philadelphia, uh, uh, and that was a big moment, I think, for the city uh, during the pandemic. So uh, yes, we've been indeed. watching that with great interest. Um, uh, so, well, thank you for, for that overview. Um, let's let's dive into the paper itself for a moment. Um, the fact that you issued this paper out of the State Department is itself somewhat remarkable, given how um, the, the U.S.-China policy has really evolved out of state from the 1970s when we first had that opening of China with the United States under the uh, the guidance of Richard Nixon. Um, and Henry Kissinger, of course. So curious to just hear how you got to a place where that kind of paper could even be produced, given the kind of a certain amount of inertia that we have seen at the State Department and really across the U.S. bureaucracy for quite a long time. Yes, uh, I agree with your, your account of matters. And uh, um, therein lies a story in response to your question. So, um, uh, I became director of policy plan staff in the summer of 2019. I, I had previously uh, served on the policy planning staff as a part-time member uh, whose portfolio was Israel. But I had absorbed um, some things during the, my first seven months on the State Department. The State Department. What I absorbed was, in particular, um, the priority that Secretary Pompeo attached to the China question, the China challenge. I heard statements like this. Um, the China challenge is, in my judgment, the challenge of our generation, Secretary Pompeo speaking. Or my first thought upon waking up in the morning, my last thought upon uh, going to, before going to sleep at night is China. So as a new director, um, I understood that our focus, the focus of the policy planning staff would be the China challenge, which is not to say that um, we would not uh, deal with other areas of the world, as, as we will discuss. Um, to deal with the top China challenge is of necessity to deal with every region in the world because of China's ambitions and because of China's uh, conduct. Well, in addition to um, uh, the secretary's in effect, his commander's intent. China is a priority. Um, I also did what uh, what I presume many of my predecessors have done upon uh, assuming this position. Uh, I returned to uh, George Kennan's long telegram of 1946. George Kennan, of course, being the founding director of the policy planning staff. His long telegram of 1946 being uh, not only uh, uh, probably the most famous cable ever written by a State Department official, but arguably the most important, the most famous document ever written by a State Department official. Um, and I reread it, and I was struck by two features 
on that rereading in, in the summer of 2019. First, um, Kennan emphasized that in order to understand Soviet conduct, uh, it was, and again, for, uh, we sh I should have said, this was a uh, cable that, uh, that Kennan uh, drafted while in the uh, U.S. Embassy in, in Moscow, sent it back to, um, uh, to Washington. Uh, to help his, uh, uh, to help the State Department and the President understand the nature of the challenge. So, first point upon uh, upon my rereading was uh, his argument that to understand Soviet conduct it was necessary to understand Soviet ideas, and there was not one but two sources of Soviet ideas. One, of course, Soviet Marxism-Leninism, Soviet communism, but second. 19th century Russian nationalism, which of necessity placed Moscow at the center to understand Soviet conduct. And in order to craft a responsible uh, response, we had to understand how the ideas affected the exercise of Soviet power. The other uh, feature which leapt out at me in the summer of 2019 um, was the, uh, the, the conclusion of the long telegram in which uh, Kennan, it's brief, but he emphasizes uh, two matters. One, he says, he argues that the United States must really tool up. We must create a new generation of diplomats, public policy thinkers who understand the Soviet Union. That means they got to study Russian, really learn Russian and understand Russian culture and history. Not because we're not interested in power and interest, but because we want to understand how the Soviet Union understands its own interests and how it's inclined to exercise power. A second point he made was that in order for the United States to prevail in the struggle with the Soviet Union over the shape of international order, it would be very important for the United States to renew its commitment to the principles that have made it strong a great nation. He doesn't use the language of um, of, uh, of founding principles and constitutional tradition, but in speaking of what it's necessary to to cultivate that civic concord that is so crucial to prosperity at home and prevailing abroad, he is highlighting what today we speak of as founding principles and um, and constitutional tradition. So. Um, as I was working on our other special project, the uh, Commission on Unalienable Rights, I was enabled to see a deep connection between that work, which was designed to recall Americans to uh, what can unite us and and prevailing in the, uh, the, the China challenge by understand in part by understanding uh, China much better, which means a new generation of diplomats and public policy thinkers immersed in the language, history, culture of China, and I should add, of other strategic competitors, friends, and partners. So that was the beginning of the China paper. That's an uh, incredibly important context. And of course, that memo is an historical one, uh, and, and I think one that uh, uh, students of the Cold War uh, will, will refer to as kind of a founding document, um, which actually raises a question about how the U.S. views the China challenge writ large. Um, now, there are those that are warning against the revival of that Cold War mentality that, of course, we were entering into at the time of, uh, of, of the Kennan memo. So the question is, is that the framework for understanding um, what the, this great power competition that we are entering into? And if not, how should we understand it? So, uh, yes, of course, it, it would be a mistake. Um, a great blunder to simply try to apply the Cold War, Cold War framework to the China challenge. In important respects, uh, the China challenge differs. Now, there is one large respect in which they are; these challenges are similar. Um, Moscow envisaged, um, if not a reconfiguration, because the post-World War II international order was still coming into existence, in 1946, led by the United States. But the Soviet Union put forward 
a conception of world order that differed prof profoundly from that of the United States. The U.S. conception of world order, a world order in which we still live, is a world order that's based on uh, uh, freedom, openness, and rules, or the rule of law. It's, a, it's an international order in which the fundamental units are free and sovereign nation states. That's very important. Um, the Soviet Union had a different view about international order. However you want to characterize it, it would not be an international order of free and sovereign nation states. It would be an international order in which nation states had a relationship to the Soviet Union, more like the states, the, um, uh, the conquered states of, of e Eastern Europe. So, um, so much for, the, for right now the Soviet Union. We believe that um, similarly, uh, China seeks, China um, has announced in official documents repeatedly, its opposition to international order so understood. Uh, China puts forward an alternative understanding of international order with Beijing at the center. So, um, so in that respect, an important similarity between the China challenge and the Soviet challenge. But here's a fundamental difference. Uh, the Soviet Union proceeded in large measure by means of um, uh, the exercise of military power. It held half of Europe through the exercise of military power. It, export, it exported weapons and military advisors and supported guerrillas around the guerrilla fires around, around the world. It propped up Marxist regimes. It installed Marxist regimes. Um, in contrast, uh, one could press this too far, but in contrast, China primarily proceeds by means of a degree of economic might that the Soviets could not even have dreamed of. Uh, China exercises through its military might, it's, it's, it seeks to uh, co-opt and coerce nations, uh, nations around the world. That means that the China challenge is very, very different. Um, there's no major country, there, <laughs> um, no, no powerhouse economy, which is not um, already deeply entwined with that of China, including, by the way, the United States of America. Uh, that means how we proceed will be fundamentally different than uh, how we dealt with uh, the Soviet Union. But the fundamental point is this one. Um, in every generation, we face challenges to, to freedom. Uh, in, in the 1950s and 60s and, and until the United States prevailed in the Cold War, the Soviet Union was the principal threat to uh, freedom uh, worldwide. Uh, we regard China today, the People's Republic of China, led by the Chinese Con Communist Party, as the principal threat to a free, open, rules-based uh, international order. And in the elements of the China Challenge, the policy planning staff paper, we attempt to um, explain why we missed the challenge for so long, look at uh, the China, Chinese conduct that we regard as um, such a deep cause of concern, the ideas behind China's conduct, and, and more. Happy to talk about that. Yeah, and I, I want you to, to, to touch on uh, the, the, the main components uh, of that report in a second, but I do want to hit on one point that you just made, uh, which is, you know, when we think about the Cold War with the Soviet Union, there was a lot of talk about mutually assured destruction from from a purely military perspective. Right now, I am struck by the fact that we have this sort of mutually assured economic destruction because of the the the, um, the, the those intertwined economies that you discuss. And this idea of decoupling does seem like one of the greatest challenges that we have. In other words, if we want to start to really enforce and enact these new policies, we have to provide ourselves with the leverage to do so, and you can't do it while the Chinese are, have our uh, prosperity, um, at least to a certain extent, in, in, uh, in their palms. Well, um, I, I agree to an extent, but we have to be, we have to be careful here. Um, 
I prefer to speak of reducing reliance on the Chinese economy, um, r radically severing our, our economies. Surely in the, in the short term, it is not in the cards. We certainly have to reduce reliance when it comes to um, crucial supply chains, medical goods, um, uh, essential parts for uh, our high-tech economy. Uh, we, we have a lot of uh, work to do. But you know, there's, a, there's another side of the entanglement of our economies, which is that prosperity in China is in part dependent upon uh, uh, the strength of the American economy and the strength of uh, other economies. That provides some leverage. So I think what we need to work on is uh, the terms under which we cooperate with China. You know, the United States seeks cooperation with all nations, um, but the cooperation has to be, um, uh, ha has to adhere to basic norms and standards of transparency and accountability. We will look for opportunities to continue to cooperate with China, provided, provided that uh, cheating, theft, other kinds of uh, unlawful conduct are not involved. Um, at the same time, we constantly have to be prepared uh, to push back against China and to and to deter where necessary. And uh, from the point of view of uh, the State Department today, this is an argument that's also made in the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. We have to, at the same time, and this is complicated, um, not cease to be champions of, of human rights, the rights that inhere in all people, and wherever um, people in China are standing for freedom, the United States must find ways to, um, to signal uh, support and uh, where practical provide concrete, concrete means of support. Okay, so with that, maybe if you would for, for just a few minutes, let's talk about the components of this paper. Um, you, you broke it down into five parts, if I'm not mistaken. We'd love to just hear a top line description of, of the areas that that policy planning sought fit to include in this landmark report. Great, thanks. Happy to do it. Um, so the first part of the paper um, addresses some some of the questions you, you've raised, which I, which I have not yet uh, addressed adequately. Uh, two big questions in the introduction are um, one: What is the cha China challenge, and why did we miss it for so long? W there are a number of ways to put the challenge. Um, here's how we put it in the paper. Uh, China is undoubtedly a great power today. Um, it is to be expected that great powers will seek eminence and preeminence within the uh, international order. But in our assessment, China does not merely seek preeminence within the established international order. China seeks to reconfigure the community of nations to make the international order much more friendly to China's uh, brand of authoritarian government. A strange mix, as I've, I've uh, suggested, of uh, the Chinese interpretation, this, I should say, the Chinese Communist Party's interpretation of Marxism, Leninism, and the Chinese Communist Party's interpretation of Chinese nationalism, an extreme interpretation of Chinese nationalism. So that's the challenge. Uh, China seeks to reconfigure world order, place Beijing at the center. Why did we miss this for so long? Well, owing in part to good reasons, um, owing in part to uh, taking our eye off the ball. Uh, as you know, in the uh, uh, beginning in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, um, we, uh, we approached China, Nixon administration approached China, uh, as uh, uh, in order to balance against the Soviet Union. Um, eventually, um, as China began to gr grow and develop, this is a result of Deng's decision in the late 1970s, of course, to uh, open the economy, to incorporate free market elements. Um, as China began to grow and develop, hopes were raised in the United States and, and in other liberal democracies and around the world that economic liberalization and the fruits of economic liberalization, modernization, um, raised standards of living would have the, have the effect 
of liberalizing the politics of the People's Republic of China. Uh, this reflects uh, a conventional wisdom in, uh, taught in political science departments around the country that economic liberalization brings political liberalization often. But as we've now learned in the case of the People's Republic of China, not always, uh, not necessarily. Um, during this late, I should say during the 1980s and the 1990s, as China was still growing, as China was still developing, uh, we saw China that um, was often in its, uh, in its outward speech accommodating and conciliatory, inconsistent, uh, sorry, I should say consistent with Deng's formula, uh, famous formulation, hide your capabilities, bide your time, H hide and bide. Um, and this is a sensible uh, approach. If you have world transforming ab ambitions, but your economy is still relatively, um, relatively small. But if one looks at the speeches and the authoritative writings of the China, Chinese Communist Party from Mao to Xi, one finds um, dramatic consistency. From the very beginning, um, there was an understanding that uh, a top priority of the Chinese Communist Party was to um, uh, was to realize the communist ideal and to shoulder the mission of national rejuvenation. From Mao to Xi, one can find this. However, uh, as China grew, as China developed, one finds uh, um, one finds stronger affirmations of this, culminating with, of course, uh, Xi Jinping, um, who. Uh, who came to power in, in 2000, 2012. So, um, so the United States was hopeful engagement and, and we were probably, we were undoubtedly overly hopeful because we didn't pay close enough attention to the conduct and we didn't pay close enough attention to the speeches and writings of the Chinese Communist Party in which they explained their, their intentions. Um, uh, I, I've already said this, but it's worth emphasizing um, the the Trump administration has affected, I think, a um, sharp break with that conventional wisdom. Now, this did not come out of nowhere. There have been uh, a number of scholars and writers now for for over over a decade. Uh, uh, in footnote number nine of the, uh, of the elements of the China challenge, you'll find a uh, a short list. It doesn't cover everybody who. Um, has nevertheless been writing over the last 10 or 15 years, um, bringing into better focus uh, the repressive one party rule of, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party at home and the not, not only the defiance of international norms abroad, uh, but the deliberate effort to reconfigure the system to make it more friendly uh, to, Chinese, to, to China's authoritarianism. So there has been a shift underway for quite a while. Um, Trump administration affects the radical break. Um, we thought it was important in our paper to, um, to demonstrate China's conduct um, and to explain that a focus on China, I've, I've mentioned this worth emphasizing, means paying attention to every region of the world. So uh, uh, you asked about the um, uh, the composition of the paper. Uh, as we were undertaking the uh, paper, now uh, almost a year ago we began the work, uh, I sent out a request to the various members of the policy planning staff and I asked uh, each member to write a short, uh, short memo, three to five pages, about China's activities in your region of the world or in the functional area that you cover in the State Department. Um, and I was astounded by what I received. What I received were detailed accounts of Chinese inroads in all regions of the world, which followed a common pattern or um, common, uh, common set of strat uh, strategies, uh, techniques, programs, every region of the world. Um, what are some of these? Uh, I'll run through them quick, 
quickly. We're now moving into uh, um, the, the out of the introduction and part two of the paper on uh, China's conduct around the world. Um, in general, and this is true if we look at the Indo-Pacific, if we look at the Middle East, if we look at Europe, if we look at uh, Africa, we look at South America, and if we look at uh, uh, North America, um, China has engaged in massive intellectual theft. Probably uh, over the la over the decades, uh, the greatest example of uh, of theft in human history. Hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars, intellectual theft. Um, second, China seeks to. You've already mentioned this, Jonathan. Uh, China seeks to commandeer supply chains and has done a pretty good pretty good job as um, we were rudely awakened to some people were rudely awakened to at the beginning of the pandemic this uh, uh, this spring but it's not only of course in um, medical equipment some supplies but it's in critical high-tech sec sectors China has um, uh, commandeered supply chains moreover China has a very aggressive uh, program to achieve industrial dominance not only in critical high-tech sector, sectors, but in other industries such as shipbuilding. Um, China seeks, uh, <coughs> excuse me, China seeks dominance um, through uh, the through uh, the building of 5G networks uh, around the world. Uh, many people by now know the name of Huawei, one of its uh, national champion companies. This is extraordinarily dangerous because. Um, a 5G system built by Huawei, operating with Huawei components, is um, almost certainly to be a system which provides information about individuals and about vulnerabilities of your nation's uh, uh, um, uh, digital network directly to Beijing. Uh, in addition to the aspiration to be the 5G provider of the world, um, China has launched the, uh, um, the well-known uh, bridge, um, bridge and Road Initiative. What is its purpose? Well, ostensibly to, um, to link China to other parts of the world, but through debt, debt trap diplomacy and other means of uh, co-optation and, and coercion, China uses the Belt, Belt and Road Initiative to induce economic and political dependence in nations around the world on uh, on China. China aims to build bridges and roads and railroads and uh, ports uh, and airports and uh, civil mo civil um, civil nuclear reactors. Often, the deals that China offers initially are very attractive, uh, but in reality, as Sri Lanka recently has found out, uh, create um, create terrible. Tr terrible problems in trying to to repay uh, China. Um, and in addition, and uh, I think FDD has done work on this, China uh, seeks to use the freedom and openness of liberal democracies uh, against us, most notably with the proliferation of Confucius Institutes. We see this in the United States. Universities sign deals with uh, China to open these Confucius Institutes. Ostensibly, their purpose is to um, uh, teach about China, maybe teach Chinese. In reality, these institutes are used to crack down on, ca on American campuses on the expression of opinions that the Chinese Communist Party believes are hostile to um, uh, um, the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. So we, we trace out in the paper, we trace out China's, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's implementation of um, of these various programs in, in all the regions of the world. In part three of the paper, we examine uh, the intellectual sources of China's conduct. We say there's a pattern and a purpose. That pattern and purpose is explained by understanding both China's specific understanding of Marxism-Leninism and China's specific understanding of, um, of what Chinese nationalism requires, what she has called the uh, China's dream of national rejuvenation and once again, we show that when these two streams of thought are combined, um, uh, one reaches the conclusion, or at least the CCP has reached the conclusion, that is incumbent upon the People's Republic of China to, uh, uh, to, 
to not only induce the kind of in, in de dependence that I've already described, but to transform, to rewire international organizations from within, to make them more friendly to, to Chinese authoritarianism. Um, I'll be briefer here. We, the part four of the paper runs through uh, vulnerabilities of the, uh, of the People's Republic of China, vulnerabilities of the Chinese Communist Party. And the fifth part called securing freedom lays out our view, not so much of, um, of the, not the specifics of what American foreign policy should be toward China, but rather a kind of framework which we think should inform um, the making of American foreign policy toward China, which and which should have as its uh, its overarching purpose the securing of freedom. Okay, well, th thank you for for the overview and and for all of you watching uh, at home. Uh, we will we'll provide a link for this uh, report, certainly worth reading and, and diving into all of these specific issues. But Peter, for, for, for now, let me let me try to drill down a little bit on some of the things that you mentioned, maybe in passing, um, to the extent that you can weigh in on it, that would be great. Um, the, the first thing is something that some of FDD scholars have been looking at uh, with greater scrutiny. Um, and that is the issue of uh, military civil fusion, that the idea that the um, the acquisition of some of this intellectual property uh, that you've talked about, this transfer of, uh, of wealth, uh, that some of the technologies here that China is looking to acquire, they may seem uh, like they're purely civilian uh, applications, but in fact, China has a grander scheme for how these technologies can assist in their the growth of their military might. Well, um, well, that's right, and we should uh, we should just for a moment uh, revert to the larger picture. Of course, military civil fusion is uh, is an application of um, a socialist understanding of the economy. A socialist understanding of the economy uh, says that um, uh, the government controls both society and and the economy. Um, in this particular case, military civil fusion means that China's biggest companies and many of uh, and many companies that are are smaller um, are an integral part of China's national strategy. It means that anything, uh, any information, any knowledge, any know-how that the company acquires is the property of the government. Um, uh, and what that means is that. Um, any cooperation with these Chinese companies, any potentially dual use technology is automatically uh, is automatically available to uh, to the Chinese Communist Party. That means that uh, that the United States, uh, fellow liberal democracies, friends and partners around the world have to be extremely cautious in in doing business with um, with uh, these Chinese companies for, for fear that uh, some of our most sensitive technology goes straight to the Chinese Communist Party, and which means also to the, uh, the PLA, the military forces in China. So to a certain extent, I guess we could, we could basically say that commerce with certain Chinese entities, state-owned companies in particular, uh, actually undermines uh, well, it might enhance us uh, through commercial means, short term, long term, we're undermining our own security, uh, which, of course, is uh, an issue that must be ironed out. Um, another issue that we've been seized with here at FTD is the question of China's um, uh, influence within the international system and international organizations. Um, you know, we actually received a question from a journalist at Axios, uh, Bethany Allen Ibrahimian. Um, she asked about this most recent report and mentioned the possibility that the China challenge may require the creation of a new or some new multilateral organizations. Can you explain what that means and, and what you have in mind? Sure. Um Let's back up for a moment, uh, though, about China and international organizations. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, other top figures in the communi Chinese Communist Par Party, uh, uh, have a phrase they like to use that um, China should promote a community of common destiny for mankind. 
a community of common destiny for mankind um, could seem desirable. It is clear that what China means by that is that uh, it is incumbent upon China to, tr to rewire international organizations from within to infuse them with norms and standards that are more friendly uh, to, to China's understanding of authoritarian governance. And China has made considerable inroads within international organizations. And uh, the State Department under Secretary Pompeo has pushed back and has pushed back hard against, uh, against China's um, work inside international organizations. We have, um, we have been aggressively uh, arguing that international organizations and those who lead them must stand for transparency and accountability in these international organizations. Having, having said all that, and in a way also addressing a question you uh, asked at the beginning about um, the challenge today and the challenge uh, um, in, the, in the 1940s and the 1950s at the beginning of the, the Cold War. Many of the international organizations that are in place today have their origins in that period. Uh, it seems to me, and this is the argument of, uh, of our paper, of our policy planning staff paper, um, the time is long overdue for a recess, reassessment of those international organizations. Not because we contemplate a world, this would be absurd, in which the United States does not participate in international organizations and international institutions but because we need a world in which international organizations and international institutions serve the purposes for which they were originally established. The purpose for which they were originally established was to construct a free, open, rules-based international order. There's no reason to assume that after uh, 70 years and more that those institutions are performing as they should. It's quite possible that a result of the reassessment, or I should put it differently, it's likely that the result of such a thoroughgoing reassessment will be that many international organizations need to be reformed. And in some cases, we will reach the conclusion that alternative international organizations need to be constructed. It's all important though to keep the purpose in mind. It seems to me that the proper purpose for the United States of America, again, is to shore up this free, our free, open, uh, uh, and rules-based international order. Um, but that, that reassessment hasn't taken place. It seems to me, though, it is the proper next step, uh, given our, um, the, the, uh, the progress we've achieved in understanding the China challenge. We uh, at FDD, we have been looking at a lot of these organizations, and, and of course, a number of them really um, are, are acting against American interests. It's not just that they have kind of uh, maybe uh, lost their way a bit, but that they really have been turned against us. And of course, China's had a role in doing so. Yes. Uh, and so we fully uh, we, we, we buy the notion that a reassessment is necessary and that perhaps new organizations may be necessary as well. Um, on, on two specific jurisdictions that we've been tracking, I, I, I want to just get a quick take from you. U.S. policy on Taiwan, U.S. policy on Hong Kong, two very different but overlapping jurisdictions, both great challenges for the United States. Um, to the extent that your paper touches on these, could you explain? Yes. Um, uh during the course of our the work on our paper, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, cracked down on Hong Kong, and contrary to its international agreements, um, uh, imposed national security laws that effectively ended freedom in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we regard this as uh, as one uh, an outrage against uh, freedom and human rights and international agreements, um, and something that we um, uh, we needed to something that um, uh, the United States must uh, find ways to oppose and oppose aggressively. The Secretary of State has uh, has spoken forcefully. Uh, 
in in criticism. We have we've gone beyond criticism. We've adopted measures that uh, designed to impose uh, significant costs on the Chinese Communist Party uh, for uh, for its outrageous unlawful action against uh, uh, against Free Hong Kong. And uh, we are concerned about Taiwan. Um, uh, we see China accumulating positions in the South China Sea. And notwithstanding what I said earlier about, uh, about China's use of economic power in contrast to uh, the Soviet Union, China has nevertheless quite explicitly been pursuing uh, the construction of a world-class military that's designed to rival and surpass eventually the military of the United States. China now has um, has formidable military forces in the South China Sea, um, uh, and the United States. Uh, it seems to me must um, must think. I put it differently. The State Department has been, and the Defense Department has been thinking long and hard about uh, how to uh, how to assist our uh, our free and democratic friends in uh, in the region. Taiwan, but of course the larger Indo Indo Pacific region as well. Um, Taiwan, as you know, is uh, um, is a major trading partner for the United States. It's a beacon of freedom and democracy in in that part of the world. And it seems to me um, preserving Taiwan's uh, freedom and independence is a is a priority. You know that that leads me to another question. Um, at FTD, we've been looking. Um, for, for months now at American deployments abroad. And of course, this is a somewhat controversial topic right now as uh, the Trump administration has called for drawdowns or redeployment from certain key bases or areas around uh, Asia, but also in Europe and the Middle East. Um, you know, and I think the question that we've been wrestling with and that I would pose to you is, you know, does drawing down, is that going to help us or hurt us long term? Of course, I understand you work for an administration that has been drawing down in certain places or redeploying, but um, this idea of maintaining that power projection capability, of defending America from abroad so that we don't need to defend right at, the, at our shores, how does this fit into the broader strategy that you've outlined in the recent um, policy planning paper? Actually, I think it fits ni nicely into the uh, broader strategy. And, and again, we, we sketch a framework, but not specific policies. Um, we actually call attention in the paper, in, the, in uh, part five, the concluding part, uh, for the United States to um, improve its effectiveness in sharing responsibilities. So, um, uh, of course, we need, uh, we want an adequate military presence uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific Indo region to deter China. Um, and that's why we are working with and calling upon our partners in, in the Quad, India, uh, Japan, and Australia, but uh, other partners throughout the uh, Indo-Pacific, also South Korea, to step up, contribute more to, uh, more to defending, defending the area. Um, you're, you're quite right that we need to take the military challenge seriously and uh, our way of doing that, which I think is a way that shows great respect for our for our friends and partners in the region. We want them to be partners, fuller partners in defending uh, defending the Indo-Pacific. And that's what we've uh, been encouraging. And by the way, I, I can report, um, I think, great strides. Um, in enhancing a bilateral relationship with India and making uh, the Quad uh, an effective um, forum for consulting about politics, economics, and uh, and security as well. So, uh, actually, to stay on the theme of partners for a moment, um, one issue that that we've been tracking very closely has been the issue of uh, the Israel-China relationship. Uh, it is been something that Trump administration officials have raised privately and publicly with the Israelis, leading to a new screening mechanism for um, foreign investment in China, somewhat along the lines of our CFIUS process here in the United States. 
Um, you know, if, if, if you can, I would just love to hear about that um, mechanism and this relationship in general, because it does seem to me that Israel might be able to serve as a model for other countries that we're looking to enlist in helping to promote American policy uh, as regards to China around the world. Um, well, I can't speak specifically about um, uh, about Israel's review process, but I can but I can certainly say emphatically that the United States strongly encourages all of our friends and partners to um, to to establish review process processes if they haven't, to review ones if they have them, uh, to strengthen and refine them because it's hugely important. As, as we discussed earlier on, um, at near the very beginning, um, completely disentangling economies with China is neither practicable nor, I think, desirable. That means every nation state is going to face um, uh, complex challenges of determining where, com where coordination and cooper where cooperation, excuse me, based on transparency and accountability is possible. That means uh, rigorous, well-constructed review processes in, in every country. So where progress is made in establishing such review processes, the United States is, is in favor and we want more. Very good. So, you know, I think when we talk about review processes, that, that's sort of the defensive side of things, right? It's about deflecting investments that are unwanted. Then there's the question of how to set countries on the right path toward cooperation with the United States on technology that the United States wants in this ongoing great power competition. And that actually leads me to another initiative. It's been led by uh, my colleague, Brad Bowman, uh, who's the director, senior director of our Center on Military and Political Power. He was the one who first suggested this idea of a U.S.-Israel operations technology working group. It's made its way into the NDAA, so it's now something that is on the congressional radar. But the idea being that we might be able to lock in with partners like Israel this idea of developing technology that would be for America to use first and foremost, and that America would have a say on how that technology may or may not be disseminated. This is another idea that we've that we've um, that we've been kind of uh, promoting, and curious to get your thoughts on how this fits into the broader strategy that you've discussed in the paper today. Well. Um on uh, on questions of uh, enhanced defense cooper the details of defense cooperation probably better to uh, speak to someone in the department of defense but i can say this um in the state department um we are almost we almost always encourage uh, greater cooperation especially enhanced cooperation with such a uh, close and important friend and partner as uh, as israel Fair enough. Um, I'm going to ask one more question of you. This also came from uh, from uh, Bethany Allen Ibrahimian from a Axios, and it's a question that I would have asked you anyway, but I think an important one. Um, and that is just in general, your advice uh, to uh, an incoming administration. I know that we're obviously there's still litigation issues that, that are ongoing and everything else. But assuming that the announcements of an incoming Biden administration are, in fact, where we're heading, um, would, curi be, would be curious, what advice would you give, parting advice, to your, uh, to your successor and maybe broadly speaking to, uh, to another administration? Yes, well, uh, I, I, I will uh, speak in terms of uh, what I think would be best for the United States of America, whoever is the next president. Um, and, and we will know what, once the vote is uh, lawfully certified. Um, First, um, t uh, take seriously China's actual conduct. Um, second, take seriously what China says about the import of its conduct um, and its aspirations. Third, be in a position to distinguish between mere rhetoric that is designed for, for consumption in the West and uh, what the Chinese Communist Party says to its members. Um, you can only do that if you, if you uh, develop, build a new generation, cultivate a new generation 
of diplomats and public public policy thinkers who know Chinese uh, and who um, have studied carefully not only uh, politics, international relations and economics, but also uh, culture and history. Uh, and finally, I, I would add, um, please, we, we must not neglect the domestic foundations of a successful foreign policy. We must uh, continue to educate the American people about, uh, about the China challenge. Uh, and we must, um, we must find ways to, um, to, to cultivate that, you can call it civic concord, um, you could call it speaking in less elevated ways, the ability for of citizens who disagree with one another to get along, uh, to see the larger picture, to understand America's uh, shared interests in, uh, in securing freedom. I think that's also very important to a successful American foreign policy that meets the China challenge. Well, I think that is an excellent way to conclude our discussion today. Uh, Dr. Peter Berkowitz, I want to thank you very much for joining us from your office over there uh, at the State Department. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, we, we can have you back in, in one capacity or another uh, to share additional insights on China and the many other issues that you track. Uh, so I'm sure we'll have opportunities to chat again. And I want to thank our audience uh, from, uh, for joining us from home or wherever you may have been watching. Uh, for more information on FTD and the latest analysis from our China program, including events uh, that will be coming soon to a laptop or desktop near you, we encourage you to visit uh, uh, www.ftd.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you.